Okay. Hello, this is Lakini Batch. She's a student who's been working with me for some time, and we're going to talk about a bunch of things uh, that may not seem to be very closely related, but actually are, and we're mm -hmm. going to explain that. So do you want to... Yeah, um, so Dr. Solis, you've been talking about Iron Man, Burning Man, Elon Musk, and how does that all come together? How do you... Right, that. so that's a very interesting question, and inquiring minds out there are probably going to want to know that this. Like occasionally you're watching a Kim Solez video, and the very next video that YouTube proposes you watch is one about Burning Man. So what's that, that, uh, that about? So I'll, tr as succinctly as I can, tell, tell you about this. So mm, I'm a pathologist and most people think that I must be there for doing autopsies like all the time and I hang out with dead people and that's just what my life is about. And actually things are very different from that. So I last did an autopsy um, about 41 year, years ago when I was a chief resident at Johns Hopkins none since then until last year and we suddenly decided that we needed to make it uniform that every faculty member would need to do autopsies including me and when that happened the resident the pathology resident I did the autopsy with her name is Claudia Nowak and she was so impressed by the experience of doing an autopsy with me that she got me this Iron Man card and it says inside uh, the genius hero and legend of pathology, so on and so forth. So that started me thinking about Iron Man, and I've not like watched a lot of Iron Man movies and stuff. I got this figurine, and when Let's you go. push on his chest, you know, he, he gives you various go. Iron Man quotes and stuff. So I, I learned a little bit that way. But then I, I discovered that there's another aspect of my life that's kind of related to Iron Man in that Elon Musk has a very heavily watched video that relates him to Iron Man. And in that video, he talks about the major discoveries that he made. And it turns out that two of them were ideas that came to him at Burning Man. He and his family went to Burning Man and they got the idea for the Tesla Motor Company and for solar power, uh, the uh, solar city enterprise that, that, that he started. So if you think of him as having three main f focuses, one, one of which is going to Mars and space travel, SpaceX, um, two out of those three are somehow related to Burning Man. And Singularity University, which I went to in 2010, the reunions were the end of August, just before Burning Man. And a lot of the young pe people there were like preparing exhibits for Bur Burning Man. And so many people thought that I should go to the, the Burning Man um, function, but the problem is that when you look at the videos, there's no one remar remotely like me in them. Um, so I kind of concluded that I wouldn't be comfortable there, I really wouldn't fit in, and it's probably an extremely bad idea for me to go to Burning Man. So when you watch a Kim Solis YouTube video and it then goes to a Burning Man video, that's not because I've ever been to Burning Man or planned to go, but it has to do with this whole Elon Musk, Burning Man, Iron Man sort of connection. Now you can also ask, um, in the areas of interest that I'm in, like kidney pathology and, and uh, regenerative medicine and so on, what would Elon Musk do if he was in the same field that I'm in and if he was, you know, like a colleague of mine and stuff? And I would claim that he would probably, like he would be interested now in the Human Cell Atlas project because it's kind of a unique part of science. It's likely to be as important as the Human Genome 
project, but in traditional meetings, they are absolutely silent about this, but on social media, it's just all over mm -hmm. social media. So I think that it, it's kind of um, humorous and entertaining and st stimulating to think, you know, what would Elon Musk do in this mm -hmm. situation? Now, I have been leaving the students books here to read, and I left one that's a biography of Elon Musk, and you read it and you quite liked it. Do you want to yeah. tell us about that? Um, I found it really inspiring, uh, and he's very similar to a lot of the things that you do. He's creative, and he likes to go beyond the limits of certain um, projects. So, for example, the Mars um, idea. I think that if he was in pathology or if he was in the same um, <laughs> field as you, I think you'd get <laughs> along really, really well because you share a lot of the same ideas and um, yeah, what do you think, what specific project do you think he would have advanced or what part? Well, I, I guess one thing that I have always felt mm -hmm. is that if you're trying to do something that actually nobody else is particularly interested in doing, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it's stupid to do it. It's like <laughs> that's that's an opportunity. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, uh, competition. Mm -hmm. So, like when 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 you have all these people talking about flying cars, mm -hmm. and Elon Musk is now he's got the boring company, right? So <laughs> he's making holes uh, holes in the in the earth. It, and you don't have to go down very far before there's no vibration felt on the sur surface mm -hmm. at all. So, I mean, you, you can do that without perturbing any of the people living above you. Yeah. And I, I kind of liken that maybe to some of the things that I've done where people told me, oh, that, that's just way too complicated. I would never get into that. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think when things are complicated enough that other people don't want to do them, that's such a remarkable opportunity <laughs> in life. Yeah. That's like the place to go, you know, because then suddenly you're, you're doing something that is, you know, unique. There's no competition. There's no metrics for exactly how much you have to accomplish in any one period of time. And I think a lot of the things that Elon Musk has done is exactly like that. Yeah. And, and the fact that, that he kind of persists, like if you think about the course, mm -hmm. you, you may know that the Technology and Future Medicine course that you've been doing the videography for and now know, know a lot about, so the first term that that was a university course, there were only two students. So I'm thinking, wow, can, can you really give a course for only two students? So I asked, like, asked all my friends to come, and you know, it, it looked like we had seven, seven or eight students, but there were only two registered students. And I suppose a lot of people would have given up at that point. I, I plastered the campus with with posters you know I did everything I could think of to promote that and actually I I, I paid for an ad in the uh, Metro uh, newspaper you know that, that people get on trains and that sort of thing and one of the two students joined the course exactly because of that she's on the train she picks up the Metro there and there is the ad <laughs> But I, I can tell you it cost me $520 for that ad, so I know exactly what it cost me to get that student. I was thinking, well, so am I going to have to pay $520 for an ad for every student? So over time, you know, it's, it's become a lot easier. Now, honestly, the interest in the course is spontaneous. But it took a lot of persistence what, during periods of time when many people thought that this course was really sort of an embarrassing aberration, you know. A lot of good ideas start like that, that people think the guy's crazy or the woman's crazy who, who proposed the thing. I, so I think Elon Musk has, has done a lot of that sort of thing of persisting with everybody telling him that this is a stupid idea, it'll never succeed. You know, there are all these big car companies and you can't compete with them and you know, who's gonna wanna get electric cars anyway and stuff. 
So yeah, no, I think that that's that's just um, I I think that uh, being on sort of a different mental wavelength from the people around you can be useful sometimes, and and um, so you you may be like. Uh, ahead of your time, but somebody has to be ahead of, ahead of the time. So, you know, if, 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 if you are working on something a few years before it becomes pop, popular, then, you know, there are many, uh, you know, advantages to that of kind of being, being ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another um, aspect that I find very interesting about you, and I think in some ways you think exceeded Elon Musk is in the mentorship aspect as well. I don't think Elon Musk has an like a room as interesting as this one. <laughs> so. No, no, I, and, and I guess like when when he said that he doesn't have time to have a you know girlfriend because how many hours a week would it take to have a girlfriend? I don't care about that amount of time and stuff. So, but uh, I think on the other hand. Um, you know, I, I I do have a life where there's really no difference between leisure time and work time. It's sort of all one thing because I I enjoy my work. And I think he's he's sort of like that too. And when things are going well, it's exciting for the people around you to be part of that kind of life. You know, it isn't completely boring. It's not exactly like working all, all the time because if you're in charge of something that's at least slightly more interesting than you know the regular work of whatever that pursuit is so yeah if if you were to watch him or me during a day i think we kind of seem to be doing the same thing the whole day whatever that is something we enjoy that involves computers and kind of communicating with people um but there is no sort of time and you say okay well now this is like leisure time you're not working anymore i mean in my mind i'm kind of always working it's 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 kind of interesting like you know i i, I have all kinds of friends including the friends from the poetry community Sometimes when I'm with one of them and my pager goes off, they get so angry. What right to people? I don't know. I mean, I'm on call, you know. But but the, this idea of 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 getting angry when 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 work calls, you know, I I never feel like that. Almost every communication I receive is positive, exciting. You know, I I I don't really feel resentment. I like the element of you know surprise, and that's that's another thing. A lot of people like a predictable life that has a past precedent. That you're conducting a life that's just like somebody else's life, and you know you kind of say, well, at this age, what were they doing, and what am I? Doing? And I've just never had a life like that. I, I I can't think of anybody who's really like me in that way. And in fact. My first mentor, Robert uh, Heptonstall, he really had questions about what I was doing, and in a way, he was right. So he felt that meetings were a complete waste of time. Well, of course, I've been or organized now, you know, the Banff meetings <laughs> since 1991. So he was like, okay, it's, it's, it's not a waste of time. But in a way, he, w he was right. The first meetings that I was exposed to were mainly social events. They were a lot of fun. They weren't accomplishing a lot in terms of the science. And maybe having a mentor telling me that meetings are a complete waste of time, they're just social events, challenged me to create meetings that actually were doing something important and were not just social events. And then now, like as my life has gone on, the other interesting thing that has happened is I could see how if I just kept going to the same meetings, that would become true. That the most of the pleasure of the meeting is seeing people that you know and renewing old friendships and so on. But when I, I decided it was important that 
transplant pathology transition to tissue engineering pathology, that meant I had to start going to new meetings, so like the termos meeting, uh, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine meetings. And so I'm going to meetings with important people there that I've never met before, that I don't know anything about, and ha having to start. And that's wonderfully exciting for, for me. And it means that at this time in my life, meetings are not just Social events. I, I look forward to getting to know the people in regenerative medicine, tissue engineering well enough so I can hang out with them socially and you know swap stories. But at the moment, it it's it's more trying to you know accomplish specific things with them and to move the you know community that I had of sort of transplant transplant pathology and to a certain extent transplant medicine toward the tissue engineering regenerative medicine you know community bring those bring those communities together you see transplant pathology and transplant medicine is mainly physicians regenerative medicine and tissue engineering is mainly phd's uh, sort of people in the non physician tr track and it would be great if through my influence, I can cause more physicians to go to those meetings. So there, 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 there is more of, of, of a kind of satisfying clinical track, if you will, you know, patient care related part of, of, of the uh, regenerative medicine, uh, medicine tissue engineering meetings. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by that and, and I, I find it fun to be like the only physician in a room. You can imagine that I'm often that way. At, at, at poetry, I, I'm that way. I, I'm, I'm often, you know, I'm like more than three standard deviations different from everybody in the room, and I'm just fine. You know, I'm, I'm sort of comfortable with that. I, I think a lot of important things you might want to accomplish require that. Require you to reach out to other groups and other you know, communities, and uh, so yeah, um, you know Elon Musk when he was a kid he was bu bullied, he was beat up a lot and stuff like that, and and he wasn't very popular in school, but if you talk to his mo mother, uh, <laughs> who was in a lot of you know it interviews about him and it was all also you know quoted a lot in that book she, she talks about how she sort of always knew that he was going to you know accomplish big things she wasn't particularly worried so he he went from South Africa to to Canada at a certain point just to kind of he, he knew that opportunities were limited in South Africa so I mean he could have starved here or something but gradually he sort of put together a life and things you know, progress from that point. So I I find what he's doing now and what his life and uh, career very you know inspiring as part of the reason that I left the book on this table. But you're you're the only one who really put, picked up that book and was you know inspired by it. I I think some of the things here I, I leave here. I, None of them has to has to work, you know. Like some of the books are of no interest to in any students, so they just gotta sit here. And others, you know, take on a life of their own, and that sort of happened with the Elon Musk um, book. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's the answer to all these burning questions you had about Burning Man and Elon Musk and Iron Man and Kim Solis, and now you know it all. And you know that in the past 40 years, 41 years, I've done only two autopsies and they're 40 years apart. So now you know everything. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>